Okay, perfect timing and auspicious start. And I'm so pleased to open our day today with a talk by Hardeep Dinsa, Deep Time on the Grand Tour, Britain, Naples, and the Pacific in the 18th century. Hardeep Dinsa is a PhD researcher at King's College London working on his doctoral thesis, which questions the relationship between nationalism and imperial identity on the 18th century British Grand Tour. In 2022, he undertook a Lever Leverhulme study abroad studentship at the British School at Rome, where he researched the wider relationship between classical antiquity and the British Empire. Hardeep is a postgraduate representative of the British Society for 18th Century Studies, excuse me, 18th Century Studies, and he recently collaborated with Bishopsgate Institute to create a walking tour of vanishing imperial architecture in City of London and the National Gallery London on a public tour of race and color in European art. Okay, so I will hand it over to Hardeep Dinsa. Again, this is deep time on the Grand Tour Britain, Naples, and the Pacific in the 18th century. Welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, this, the research presented today is taken from the second chapter of my doctoral thesis, which concerns the interconnectedness of classical and colonialism, sorry, uh, classicisms and colonialism on the ground in the 18th century, and also the fetishization and marginalization of Italian scholars in researching their own histories. In the chapter, I explore how gender and religion were markers of racial difference in modern Rome before looking at climate-based racial prejudice in Naples. In this paper, I reveal how contemporary exploration in the Pacific formed an ethnographic template from which Southern Italy, as well as Pompeii, might be understood. While in the global context of climactic theory, Southern Italy was situated in the ideal place, geopolitically it occupied a more liminal space in the British imagination. Extending far into the Mediterranean, within reaching distance of the North African coast, alongside a long history of Islamic rule, regions like Sicily sat and still sit at the border of the European world. Indeed, it's only recently that this exoticized view of Naples and the South as marginal, wild and exotic has been questioned. Grand tourists in the 18th century certainly did not view the remoteness of southern Italy in a neutral cartographic way. Instead, they projected contemporary notions of otherness onto it, forming an almost microcosm of colonial scientific observation. For those whose travels were confined to Europe, their journey to the frontiers of the continent paralleled their seafaring countrymen's encounters on the frontiers of empire, providing, quote, a place for the fear of strangers, end quote. In this sense, Southern Italy becomes a contact zone between British tourists and modern Italians. This holds true for the simple fact that Naples and less commonly Sicily were the southernmost points most travelers would reach before returning home, a kind of microcosm for the entire Mediterranean world and even for more exotic climates. And even then it was only due to the accidental discoveries of Pompeii and Herculaneum and to a lesser extent Pistum and Magna Graecia that led, on the one hand, to the creation of new reasons for traveling towards the south, and on the other hand, to the extension of the geographies, and therefore the curiosity and interest of travelers, regardless of their country of origin. This geographic expansion of the Grand Tour as a reflection of curiosity can be mapped onto the colonial desire to experience new locations and customs, which in turn reflected the primacy of the first-hand witness in later 18th century travel literature. Travel literature from the period firmly locates the South as an entity to be considered separate from the rest of Italy. In his Travels to the Two Sicilies, Henry Swinburne expresses his total disappointment in the very normal flat landscape of Taranto. He writes, it's totally different from the bold beauties of the Italian landscape. In this case, the expectation of the bold reveals a desire for foreignness in these travels. Chard similarly states that these necessary elements allow for a spatial separation between the viewer who is used to the tame and the familiar from the foreign. The distance of the region from Britain is also mentioned as a way of signifying its geographic marginalization, 
Joseph Spence only travels as far south as Naples, but his language in doing so paints the journey as an incredible distance. He writes, Naples is the very farthest point we are to go from England, and the morning we set out to return from thence hither, it was a common observation among us all that we were then first returning homeward again. In another letter written a few months later, Spence firmly locates Naples as a liminal space where reality and myth seamlessly blend, reinforcing the notion that Naples as the border between the European world and whatever lies beyond, invoking geographies from ancient Greece. He writes, this horror and beauty of the country, so oddly mixed together, made the old poets perhaps place their hell and Elysian fields both in the neighbourhood of Naples. Don't be frightened if I tell you that I have seen both. We can also point to the changing landscape as the traveller moves south as a way of psychologically entering a new territory. Perhaps another unique factor which contributed to the marginalisation of the south was the fact that it was a Spanish territory governed by viceroys, essentially marking it as a colonial space possessed by one of Britain's colonial enemies. This was heightened by the popular image of areas like Sicily as relatively backwards, with its inhabitants closer to nature and unable to control their sensual urges. Furthermore, its looser legislation and cultural customs surrounding sexuality enabled British men and women to indulge in fantasies not possible in the North thereby mimicking the degradation seen amongst Britons who settled beyond Europe on a much smaller scale. Furthermore, while Sicily had already pr been producing sugar from the 9th and 10th centuries when it was under Arab rule, the Spanish crown was slowly introducing more exotic crops to the island to import to the mainland, again shifting the perception of Sicily from European island to a colonial landscape, or even a garden curiosity as well as potatoes, tomatoes, prickly pears, maize, and bell peppers, Aztec chocolate was produced in Modica using imported cocoa. Balufa has written extensively on the orientalizing tendencies in perceptions of Bourbon Spain by European travelers, and her arguments apply equally to the colony of Sicily, particularly since critiques of Arab influence on the mainland apply equally to the island. Dubbed the rudest by the Critical Review in 1775, the Bourbon brand of absolute monarchy was frequently viewed closer to Asian despotism than the monarchies of Northern European on the spectrum of political characters. If Southern Italy was seen as, quote, the cradle of European civilization, end quote, and a site beguilingly oriental in its essential characteristics, then it can be further contextualized within wider disseminated theories of human progress which in turn reveal a reading of the region parallel to contemporary theories of cultural stagnation in the East. That is, a once powerful region whose people had not been able to progress and have subsequently been surpassed by other states. If we follow the stagial theory mapped out by Adam Smith, then Sicily sits at his third stage or the age of agriculture rather than the age of commerce within which most of the Northern European empires would be situated. Smith's theory in and of itself was not racially motivated and was rather used to explore economic growth and property rights. It was, however, very quickly laid over proto-racial theories by other natural scientists, such as Linnaeus, who placed the four continents on the four rungs of human civilization. What emerges from these discussions, then, is a parallel between descriptions of the frontiers of empire and the frontiers of Europe. The Asiaticus species, described by Linnaeus in the 1758 edition of Systema Naturae, is a stern, haughty, greedy people governed by opinions. The Neapolitans, similarly, are noisy and underbred, and they're made up of, quote, ignorance, pride, and show, and suffer from a certain distemper. These comments were made by Lennox, and they also reveal a parallel in forms of government when she claims that the Neapolitan government is weak and oppressive. The East was also seen to suffer from a weak government due to its hot climate, a view inherited from classical texts like Airs, Waters, Places by Hippocrates, and parroted in the long 18th century from Buffon to Elphinstone. Montesquieu goes further in that he maps these contemporary theories onto ancient geographies to prove that the East hadn't changed. Compared to the Germanic tribes, at that point seen as the ancestors of the modern French race, 
he writes, Indians were cowardly and indolent and were still in the 18th century, end quote. For the peoples of southern Italy, it was not that they were always backwards, but rather the perfect climate had shifted to the north, meaning that the south began its slow assimilation to eastern stereotypes. He writes, modern Naples has nothing of the ancient Parthenope except its heat and its idleness. These sentiments on the north-south divide are further encapsulated in the writings of Philip Thickness. He writes, the natives of the southern parts of Europe have neither the beauty, strength, nor comeliness of men born in more northern climates. Whoever compares the natives of Switzerland, England, Ireland, and Scotland with those of Spain, Portugal, or other southern climates will find that men born among cold, bleak mountains are infinitely superior to those of the finest climates under the sun. A discussion of the Mezzogiorno, or the South, as a subaltern region cannot be made without consulting the writings of Antonio Gramsci, who, although writing primarily about northern hegemonic power over the South after the Risorgimento, experienced somewhat of a minority existence due to his Sardinian roots. As well as providing a much-needed class-based framework that my reading of the Grand Tour relies on, Gramsci's reading of the role of European peasantry finds immediate parallels to the state of 18th century Sicily. In this case, a colonial population that has become the foundation on which the whole edifice of capitalist exploitation is erected. These populations are required to donate their whole of their lives to the development of industrial civilization. The South, then, as a potential stop on the Grand Tour, was a marginal space, both physically and culturally. Its population was heavily critiqued for their lack of European civility, and the remote landscape pulled the traveller away from the known European world and invoked a way of categorising the world through a distinctly colonial lens. The above perceptions of Southern Italians are well documented in secondary scholarship, but within the context of this thesis, they evolve from prejudiced critiques to a more systematic approach to intra-European travel that was very much in conversation with extra-European travel narratives. What's relatively understudied is the conflation of Southern Italy with the colonies in the New World and the very recently observed Pacific Islands. For example, in his descriptive account of the island of Jamaica, published in 1790, William Beckford of Samali, who made his fortune through sugar plantations and the slave trade, compared Jamaican landscapes to those picturesque and elegant ruins which so ennoble the landscape of Italy. James Johnson compared the natural disaster at Lake Lugano with China, since he had, quote, witnessed a Chinese typhoon, an eastern tornado, and a western hurricane. But the scene for which seven hours passed under our eyes might claim kindred with the wildest of these. For Neapolitans in particular, Grand Tourists found natural comparisons between them and other remote populations. Louis Simon was particularly scathing in his Tour of Italy and Sicily, published in 1828, where he wrote, The manners of the Neapolitans are those of Tahiti, or of nature. They do wrong without shame or remorse whenever it suits their immediate purpose, enjoying animal life day by day without the smallest care about the next. Returning to the letters of Caroline Lennox, whose tour only extended as far south as Naples, she makes some revealing comments on the culture of the region. Describing clothes worn during the holidays, she writes the following. There's a great mixture of the ancient and the eastern dress here, some very like those of the Greek islands in the saint Temple. They wear very singular kind of white veils. The hair of those you see without veils is drawn back and breaded with bodkins or plaited as you see the hair of the ancient busts exactly. The body dress seems very eastern, no stays but close waistcoats, laced with gold lacing, loose jackets of black velvet, scarlet cloth, and various other colours richly laced, some of them with gold, gold chains about their necks, and gold earrings. Some ones seen in milk-white waistcoats, white veils, and a white petticoat with a border embroidered in worsteds of divers colours. The use of both ancient and eastern to describe their clothing has two likely meanings. Rather than approaching them as separate and exclusive descriptors, I argue that they should be read together and thus support the traditional reading of the East as a land stuck in the past, ancient in its heritage but backwards in its modernity, blurring temporal boundaries. The emphasis on gold ornaments was a common trope used to describe the Bourbon Neapolitan nobility, 
And in the context of this thesis, it also serves to further associate the population to the east, where the overwhelming use of gold was attributed to decadence and unbridled luxury. Hester Lynch Piozzi also makes this remark and compares them unfavorably to Turkish fashions. In Piozzi's observations and reflections, she introduces comparisons between Neapolitans and indigenous Americans, who she calls Indians. She laments in great detail about the region's transition from a land overflowing with classical importance to one that has been, quote, overwhelmed by tyrants, earthquakes, and Saracens, end quote. Piotti uses the shock of Northern Italians at the traditions that Neapolitans picked up over the centuries to justify her perceptions. Most interestingly, she calls the act of burning effigies a, quote, half Indian custom. It is, however, later in this account, when describing the Lazzaroni, who are the poorest of the lower class, that Piozzi's comparisons become more explicit. She writes, One need not, however, wander around the world with banks and solander, or stare so at the accounts given to us in Cook's voyages of tattooed Indians, when Naples will show us the effects of a like operation very, very little better executed on the broad shoulders of numberless Lazzaroni. She later incorporates Pacific Islanders into her observations when she told of a female Lazzaroni's barbarous conduct by a Milanese officer. She writes, his account of female conduct, and that even in the very high ranks, was such reminded me of Queen Oberea's sincerity that Sir Joseph Banks joked about her and Otoru. What her travel accounts evidence is that there was a flourishing exchange of knowledge between the metropole and the colonies, and that these new world encounters were actively at the forefront of travellers' minds when they were in the classical ruins of southern Italy. It also suggests that the Grand Tour was being approached in a similar framework of colonial observation and understanding, in a way elaborated to frame the consideration of the relative merits of nature versus civilization, and a mirror in which Northern European readers might rediscover fading aspects of their own selves. By the close of the century, Italy was counted among the non-European and peripheral contact zones of the Romantic movement, offering the chance to reimagine European identity through the absorption of non-European imagery. Indeed, to the degree that Romanticism shapes the new discourses on America, Egypt, Southern Africa, Polynesia, or Italy, these territories also shape the movement. It's important to note that the inverse of this phenomenon can also be observed, that the known primitivism of Southern Mediterranean societies was being used to understand colonial populations. Quilly, for instance, identifies artistic instances where the Pacific Islands were seen through a Eurocentric picturesque lens, in this case more negatively. He writes that George Foster took issue with William Hodge's view of the landing at Ewa for portraying the islanders as classicized types, and thus sacrificing documentary fidelity in favor of a historicizing comparison between contemporary Pacific and ancient Greek societies. Franklin offers an ex explanation for the phenomenon of viewing remote Pacific geographies through the lens of classical antiquity. He writes, if the profusion of unknown natural objects in America and elsewhere place an extra burden on the traveler's mind and language, then conveying it within known geotemporal frameworks offered a sense of understanding to those back home. The argument can be made then that this can happen in reverse, that framing intra-European travel through the lens of the distant colonies increased the perception of difference and distance. As Pratt argues, the ideologies of legitimate bourgeois authority that enabled social critique abroad could also be made within Europe. So for this reason, it's not surprising to find German or British accounts of the Mediterranean sounding a lot like German or British accounts of Southern America. This counters the traditional argument made by writers like Commerz some decades ago that travel literature about non-European areas differed not only in content, but also in form from writings on travel within Europe. Not only did travel accounts of the Southern Mediterranean in the first half of the century mimic linguistic othering found in early modern travel literature, but as the century progressed and European empires turned their attention to the East, the language of alterity within Europe progressed alongside it. Moore and Morris, for instance, cite both the growth of the Grand Tour and colonial travel as primary factors in the genre of historical geographies. <laughs> 
Furthermore, Mo argues that in the, by the mid 18th century, we see the rise of a homogenous image of the backward South tape shape, specifically within the context of the region's distance from Western European civilization and of its liminal position with respect to Africa and the Orient. Unsurprisingly, this shift happens at the same time colonial expansion begins its exponential growth, for Britain in particular after the Seven Years' War. The comparisons made between contemporary Neapolitan culture and Pacific cultures also appear in the excavations of Pompeii. In a 1775 edition of the Monthly Review, the following comment was made about the phallic objects found. The proofs are of the most extraordinary kind, and quite on the level with those which Captain Cook found in some of the South Sea Islands. So as well as evidencing the colonial networks of knowledge that informed continental travel, the comment points to the universalization of natural history, which proliferated enlightenment thought. Though separated temporally and geographically, the grouping of both objects could be dictated by the same governing laws of taxonomy. In this case, they prescribe to Herringman's concept of deep time, articulated as capturing an unfamiliar aspect of the conventional trope of exploration and time travel. As he argues, the excavations at Pompeii and Herculaneum, in particular the introduction of the study of everyday life and cultural empathy, would influence how Pacific travellers conducted their anthropological research. When the Italian antiquary Giovanni Giovene described a cache of even older artefacts found in the Kingdom of Naples in the 1780s, he compared them explicitly to the South Pacific artefacts brought back to Europe by Captain Cook. The Neolithic jadeite axes from this site, in his view, precisely resembled stone tools that were collected in Tahiti and passed on to collectors in Giovanni's local network. Dankerville's patron and collector, Sir William Hamilton, also referred to Cook's voyages in a natural history of volcanoes that was modelled on the scholarship of the Italian connoisseurs. Hamilton made the point that these stone tools from Tahiti were made of volcanic rock and thus supported this thesis that volcanic eruptions were geologically formative events, not only in antiquity, but across the earth and across time. This intrinsic connection between the Grand Tour and colonial travel was also noted by Smith, who argued that travel to the Pacific Islands, as popularized by narratives of Cook's voyages, was seen almost as a natural evolution to the classical Grand Tour. So what I hope to have achieved in this paper, as well as in this thesis as a whole, once it's complete, is offer a new perspective of the Grand Tour, which firmly places it within the matrix of Imperial Britain. In its current form, secondary scholarship on the Grand Tour isolates the phenomenon from events happening beyond the metropole, but by introducing the two, we can better understand the intricate relationship between classics and colonialism in the 18th century and the treatment of contemporary Italian scholars in these same fields. Thank you very much.